very honored to host uh, Carlene Lolly Jeshitarski, um, who is the author of uh, Memorable Milwaukee, which you can see here. I'll be sending you a link on how to purchase the book from Boswell. We have it actually at 10% off the list price right now. Uh, full color book for um, $20, so a really wonderful uh, price point on that. Um, and it's 10% uh, off for a few more days for folks who didn't decide to buy it until they saw this wonderful program. Tonight, um, she is going to be in conversation with Virginia Small, who is a, a landscape preservationist and writer for the Shepherd Express. Um, we will be experimenting with sharing screens, so, uh, but we did test and it seems like it's going well. Um, and um, this is uh, basically uh, the creation of a, of, of work that has been um, in the process for years, uh, a labor of love for the city she loves. Um, and I know Virginia loves it too. And so I'm going to pass on uh, the uh, work to uh, Lolly and Virginia. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Daniel. So I will, I will be asking Lolly uh, questions. Uh, that's her name that she goes by to her friends and family. So, um, so I will ask questions and then we'll also have conversations uh, as, as uh, she's talking about her book, I may share uh, some thoughts. Um, so this will be primarily a discussion, but you are welcome to ask questions in the chat room as Daniel mentioned. So, and we will um, tr try to keep track of those through, throughout the program and um, so I'd like to start by, I, I'd like Lolly to introduce herself uh, in some respects because you've heard a little bit about her, but she has an interesting background as a teacher and a writer who became a sculptor in clay. So Lolly, what, what, how would you describe that journey that you, that you moved from teaching and writing to working in, as an artist? Before I describe the journey, I must say thank you, Daniel. Part of my journey has been through a variety of bookstores, especially even going back to Harry Schwartz's down on Wisconsin Avenue. And I am, I love Boswell books and I thank Daniel so much for permitting me to share my book with you tonight. And I thank Virgie for um, acting as the coordinator of this. And I thank all of you who are here because <laughs> <laughs> there's great drama going on out in the world as well as here in our Zoom room. So um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And to to now go back to Virgie's question, how did I get into this? Um, I, have, I have been a writer and a teacher all my life. I'm the eldest of five children, so I was always like the teacher. And writing, writing was my thing, English was my thing. And um, storytelling, which is at the base of this narrative journey that I'm on has was it made it easy to slide over into clay, and um, in which I've been doing since 1982, and it kind of took me by surprise too. I had been doing puppetry with children and puppet making, but as soon as I put my hands in clay, um, I knew that. That was what I wanted to do. And I made a coil pot of a snake and I inscribed the word inside his, H-I-S-S dash story, his story. So I've kind of stuck with that. And tonight I'm not going to concentrate a whole lot on process of the clay side, like how I do it, but I do want to share and let's do a little show and tell in my teacherly mode. Um, this is a picture of a work in progress. This is sculpted in clay, it's not fired, and it's taken in my studio. And um, 
this happens to be George Stebbins holding a lighthouse up because George Stebbins was this wonderful woman who was the lighthouse keeper for the East Point Lighthouse. So next time you're walking over in that direction, you can think about Georgia. That's in, that's in Lake Park, um, Lake, mm -hmm. Lake Park. And it was, it was actually a, a predated Lake Park, the uh, lighthouse. So that's, a, they have a great uh, story. They have a great interpretation of that history at the lighthouse, um, which has a museum now. Right. So, so the, and, and that is one of the featured uh, images and stories in memorable Milwaukee. So, uh, so I, I would like, uh, Lolly, if you would talk about when you began telling stories about Milwaukee people and events in, in your works of art. When I began telling Milwaukee stories? Right. I mean, you've, you've done other subjects, but this, this oh, right. theme of, of Milwaukee stories, how did that evolve? Thank you. This book has been about 12 years in the making. Um, I haven't constantly worked on it for 12 years, but intermittently. Um, and as as I've researched and found interesting people and events, um, I thought this would be something that would be that I could share. First of all, a few of them um, I was still teaching at the time, and I was able to share them with creative writing students, and we were able to um, do some interviews of Milwaukee people based on their experiences in history with people who had been involved in historic things or even everyday life. And um, I find it important that we tell these stories and share them with one another. And, and Milwaukee is for us home, even if it's a temporary home, this is where we are now in this time. And that was a message I conveyed in my teaching and that I hope comes through in my work that this is where we are here and now and try to grow in appreciation for the past. So perhaps through some of these sculptures, we mentioned Our Lady of the Lighthouse, Georgia Stebbins. Um, the book has 20 different images in. I have done more than 20, but I chose 20 for the book. And um, each of them is anchored in a time and a place. So it's actually possible to um, go to those places. And um, of course, most of them don't exist as they were, but to, to be in the places and to know the history of that spot can be an enriching experience and an anchoring experience for life. And, and Lolly, um, could you tell me about the, the first, uh, pers the first uh, sculpture that you did, the first person that was, uh, uh, that <laughs> before you ever envisioned a book, there was a person who Oh, sure. The first sculpture I did um, was Lizzie Kander. Lizzie Kander was um, a woman who, actually turn of the century she was born in um that can't be right <laughs> um okay she she was she graduated from high school in 1889 and was valedictorian and it, it was called milwaukee high school it later became riverside and what did a brilliant young woman do at that time? Well, she could work in her father's hardware store. She could do volunteer work. She could get married. Fine. She chose another path and did eventually marry, of course. But she became part of <clears throat> the Ladies Relief Sewing Society. And in 1894, she became their president. And at the time, um, she was able to work at the Milwaukee Jewish Mission, which has a location, by the way. It was the Jewish Settlement House was at 
507 5th Street. So next time you're down in that area, um, you can maybe think about Lizzie. Or another way to think about Lizzie is to find a copy of the Settlement House cookbook and uh, make something out of the cookbook. I made a sculpture of her. It was my first one because I had been talking to my creative writing students about cookbooks and, and we had we were doing a kind of a project. And um, Lizzie Kander worked with immigrants from all different countries. Um, and she taught cooking and um, health and um, they got together and they published a cookbook. They tried to get money from the board. The board thought it was not a money maker and refused to fund it. So the women got together and raised the money and published their cookbook. And to this day, I, it well, I think you can still find a lot of copies of it. There might be a reprint available yet somewhere, but maybe Daniel would know that. But um, it's it went for a long time. So then what, uh, what, how do you think you chose individual people or in some, in a couple of cases, it was a story, not an individual person. How, what drew you and, and what was the process of translating that, the, that person's life in some fashion into a sculpture? Well, you just look at all the resources you can find and, um, Think about the person and especially go for images. Check out the usual sources, the uh, Wisconsin State Historical Society, the County Historical Society, um, Google, anywhere you can find information. And if you notice behind me, a lot of books. <laughs> um, since I was once co-owner of the Dancing Bear Antiquarian Bookstore, along with my husband, um, we managed to gather quite a few books into our lives, especially the history ones back here were um, mostly George's. Because oh, I and look at, we have someone who has a copy of the Settlement Cookbook. Ooh. Kay Augustine is showing it on the screen. So, and I, I actually uh, picked up a copy of the Settlement Cookbook. I, I, had, I had heard of it before then, but then um, hearing Lolly talk about it a lot, I really decided to, to get the cookbook. And it has a lot of really great classic recipes. I, I, I see Kay nodding. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that, that Lolly and I were talking about is that the, the, the history that we're individually drawn to that there's often some sort of a, of a portal or a hook, uh, something that draws us in to want to know more about that person or that story. And, and that can vary for, that will vary for each of us, but the artifacts that we come across, uh, whether it's something like a cookbook that's still in print or even if it's out of print or an image or something, or a story or a place. Uh, I'm particularly drawn to places and often I don't know anything about the history of them, but it's, it's possible to um, have some sort of entree that then leads us into doing our own individual research. And uh, Molly, you had talked about roaming around in that person's world. Did right. It's, it's been easy to roam around in, in the past. The past is another country um, that has implications for our world today, which we're certainly feeling right now. Um, if you think of the links of what's gone on with our history, um, when you think of Milwaukee, even going back to Solomon Juno, and um, one, of the, one of the founders, of one of the, considered one of the three mm -hmm. original founders of the city. Yeah, and um, one and the first sculpture I include in the book is a sculpture of Solomon Juno, and um, and if Daniel wants to pull up um, image number two, that is. 
there we are. This is kind of a, a different kind of sculpture, which is taken directly from an image in um, this book, Chronicles of Milwaukee. Oops, where am I? <laughs> Chronicles of Milwaukee. And um, the story that goes with it was Solomon Juno, you know, as we go to Juno Park, we see a little log cabin and think of Solomon Juno in a cabin with all his children and his lovely wife, Josette. Um, in 1842, Solomon Juno had other ideas and on the corner of Water and Michigan, which would be the southeast corner, he built a fancy house, a clabbered house with two chimneys. And at that time, a house with double chimneys was, was the sign of wealth. Um, so he had this house and, and he was also the postmaster. He was very enterprising and um, he actually would take in lodgers if they wanted to. And outside, he had a picket fence. There were two posts and he had bears chained to them. And that was like uh, something for the delight and diversion of the people of the area who happened to go by. Um, and James Buck in the Pioneer History of Milwaukee finally recalls leaning against that fence with a Menominee chief named Old Saki, who was one of his buddies, and watching the bears. And when you think of it, how, how culture has changed now, how, how would we respond to two bears being chained outside and, um, and having, having this sort of of um, post office and hotel all at once. Wow! So, wow. Well, talk about wildness in the city. Right. You know, that's a very different <laughs> idea than, than we would have now. The village. The, um, Life was very wild there. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so someone asked if some of the statues could be uh, should be shown and, and described. One of the things that I uh, find fascinating about these works, now you're only seeing a single image in the book, unless there's, in some cases, there's a second uh, image shown, but there's there's a whole storytelling of, of, of like a tableau, as it, as here in this one, but in, in many of these, where there's little details that are included that are hints to the, to the deeper story yeah, we, or we could, layers of story. Mind. We could look at the increased Lapham that has a front and a back. That's um, Daniel five is the front and six is the back for increased Lapham. And um, you can see here, this is someone who's very important to Milwaukee history and actually to Wisconsin history. And um, on the front of the sculpture, you will see this image. And um, I was um, quite enamored of his life and how he came to Milwaukee and was able to almost see into the future. Um, and he viewed all the all the preciousness of nature around him uh, on the lake shore, Lake Michigan. He was, he was um, a gatherer of fossils and minerals. And so when I was trying to think what image I would create of him, and part of it is when you're, when you're making a sculpture of someone and it's someone from the past, you only have a few images to work with. And to, to take the flat image of a photograph. Fortunately, I was able to find side images and quite a few pictures of increase. So um, I was able to make 
probably a fairly accurate, like I think if he looked at it, he'd say, yep, that's me. <laughs> but um, it could make a fairly, a fairly adequate representation. But also then with increase on the back, which I show on image number six, this is like a little history lesson almost. Um, giving information about his life, his years. And that's actually um, one of the very early maps ever made with the plot, the, the plot lines drawn into lots, which was, um, which he made. He was a great surveyor. He was a city surveyor for a while and a map maker. And, um, also, he, was, he was considered Wisconsin's very first scientist mm -hmm. and was so, so multifaceted and self-taught. Right, right. Um, and one, of, one thing that I find very fascinating about him is the image on the right-hand side. It looks like a rabbit almost, that animal. Um, that is from his, his book, um, The Antiquities of Wisconsin, that um, he went around the state and he realized that the settlers were totally demolishing the mounds that were plentiful around the state of Wisconsin. So he took it upon himself to map out all the locations and all the mounds um, in Wisconsin. And so I wanted to be sure to have that representation there. And then on the left, you'll see the, the weather arrow because he was called the first weatherman, even the weather bureau. Some people say he started the weather bureau because through his observations, he was able to figure out when there would be storms and give word for the, the ships. So um, eventually his knowledge was passed on and um, verified. And so- And there's a, the, if people are interested in a place, <laughs> there's and, numerous places in the city of Milwaukee that, that actually could have markers. I'm not sure that, that they do, but out in, out in the Delafield area, Lapham Peak of mm -hmm. West in Waukesha County, that was where he was doing some of his research and they do have a marker, historic marker out at Lapham Peak. So, so that's um, the, one, of, one of the things that uh, Lolly has, has talked about going, <laughs> in, you've talked about going to each of these um, subjects to find the, the locations, finding somewhere through your research an address of where they lived or where they had right. taught or went to school or this or that. So, so tell, tell us a little bit about what happens when you, when you go to these places. Do you, what kind of, um, how do you feel when you, when you are in a place that you know, um, has that history? Why don't we look at image number three? And very briefly, I will talk about this. Yesterday happened to have been the anniversary of, of the death of Father James Grappi. So I was thinking a lot about him. Um, the sculpture here is, um, it found its place in my church. And um, the, reason, the reason I included it is because here you see on the base of the sculpture, there are those little pieces of metal. And um, before I made the sculpture, I went under the bridge, which is called, which used to be called the 16th Street Viaduct. And now it is called the James E. Grappa Unity Bridge. And there were all these strange little you can see those metal things. I have no idea what they were. And I knew right away that I would have a use for those in my sculpture. A lot of times I will incorporate 
found objects in my work. And I didn't have anything to put it in. So I found like an old, an old McDonald's coffee cup in the, just there and scooped them up and was able to incorporate them into the sculpture. If we want to move on, because we've got so many other, are there any questions so far? Are we supposed to, uh, we can take questions, I think. They can... I'll, I'll look here. Um, someone, someone said that the uh, settlement cookbook uh, is no longer updated, but there is a facsimile of, the, of, of an older edition. Ah. And I think there were nu numerous editions. But yes, if anyone has questions, uh, please please consider uh, adding your uh, questions to the chat. And then we'll, right up there and we'll do our best. We'll respond as we can. So um, what, when you, you talked, the, the title of this book is Memorable Milwaukee. And so what role does memory play in, in the life of a community, of a city, not just an, in, in an individual? Uh, what what role um, does it play in, in your life also as a, as an artist or writer? You can start with either the personal or the well. As, that's a big question, Virginia. As a, as a city, I hadn't really thought about this much, but there is like a common citizen memory, which in some some people. Um, it might just be what happened last week. And in others, it can go way back in time. Um, Spielberg, um, after he made his Abraham Lincoln movie, he spoke at Gettysburg. And one of the things he said is that memory is imperfect. History keeps track of memories but there's always this combination between the actual event, the memory, and the remembered event, and then the remember remembrance of the memory of the memory going, a chain going through time. Huh. Yet also, in addition to the memory on that level, your actions and the actions of people in our past have had a cause effect a chain of events in the city like what if what you can do the what if, you can play the what if game with all kinds of things um what if our founders had not valued parkland what if they had not set aside land for parks think of how we use that every day um and how and, it, there, and there was a point where there was a debate that lasted for 30 years where people discussed whether we would have public parks other than a little square here and there. And for 30 years, the debate went on and people, many people said vigorously, no, we don't, we don't need that. We don't, we can't, we can't afford that. We can't do that. So there was a, there was a real decision that a particular couple of people really pushed it. Christian Wall being one of the foremost, but that is an interesting thought. And so we can, I guess what you're saying is you could do thought experiments of what, you know, what would happen if this or that happened. I, I'm gonna go back to one of the things when you were talking about the, the, the uh, Father Grappi and Belle Phillips and the, the marches oh, yeah. for, for okay. open housing. One of the things a few years ago, there was a celebration of the 50th anniversary of those marches. And I went, I went on a bus tour along with Adam Carr, one of your students. And uh, at Rufus, at Rufus King. and actually, most of the places where these events happened had been de had, been, had been demolished. Right. So, the, except for the bridge and Kosciuszko Kosciuszko Park and things, but many. It's interesting because there was no value attached during the, the period following all of that history, which was really groundbreaking history people didn't think of any of those places as having any significance worth preserving. Mm -hmm. And I think often there's a lot of questions about what should be preserved or not. And 
I think part of it is that people don't understand that the, the embodied place actually can help to pass along those memories. And so it often takes people saying, well, that history is important. Let's see if we can keep uh, some, some aspect of it so that you can go to a place and it still is a place where something happened, as opposed to going to a place where there's something completely different there. And if you happen to know the address, you can say something happened there. So that's, uh, so, but Lolly's, you're telling these stories is also reminding people to keep some of that memory alive. Or maybe right. things you, you never knew about that and, you can, yeah. that you can, uh, so that, that takes us, I think you've talked a little bit about the, your personal memories and things you're drawn to, but here's another big question. So, so why does history matter? I, could you repeat that, please? Why, my, does, why does history matter? Why does history matter? Well, to me, it's a twofold question because there's history that is documented history um, based, you know, you look at and, and more and more we're having a different type of documentation, but we still have documentation. And the objects of history. Um, but then there's another kind of history, which is when an artist or a musician or a movie maker looks at history and we can take liberties that um, an academic historian cannot take. They must look at the artifacts and the primary sources. And oh, um, can can okay there he came back. <laughs> um, were there, were there another couple of things? Something too hard and my screen went. <laughs> oh okay. And, and so could you? How about another image? Do you have another image that you could tell a story about how you? Um, took, took I wanted to, and it it follows directly with what we're talking about because. Um, a lot of my images are quite close based on, um, based on primary sources and based on photographic images, lithographs, everything I could find. But um, let's take the case of Laura Ross Wolcott and, um, oops, that would be, um, Image one, um, I had only one picture to work with, with her, and uh, it was pretty hard uh, because at that point, and it was a profile picture, which I have somewhere in here, um, a profile picture of her with her little spectacles, a very formal, almost formidable picture. And um, so I had to look at the side view and try to reconstruct. And then this brought another problem to the fore. Actually, I, um, I would like to hold, Daniel, um, I wanna hold up a picture here, a photo. So let's move on for one second and then come back to this, please. Um, okay, this is the photo that I had to work with from the archives of the Wisconsin Historical Society. There may be more pictures out there, but I did her during COVID era. And so I was a little bit limited <laughs> to my resources, but I wanted to do this sculpture very badly because, because she was a discovery that I made and I, I had never known about her before. And this is when it can get really exciting and fun because it's a learning adventure. And um, she was the first woman physician in Milwaukee. And if you noticed, um, Daniel, if you could please put the image back up again. 
if you notice, there are two pictures of her. And the first, the one, she came here as a physician, a doctor, ready to serve. And do you think the Milwaukee Medical Society welcomed her with open arms? No. Mm -mm. Um, as a sculptor, I had to think how I wanted to portray her because all of this, this past was not open to me and we just had that one image and then I thought well how would she dress she'd want to be sanitary maybe and there were lots of pictures of nurses from that era especially English nurses um, I thought well maybe along those lines but she should have her um, signature doctor's bag so I made that's how I portrayed her however however she had another life another very important role in the life of our city in that she, because of the bad way she was treated, she became a strong advocate for women's rights. And she was a tireless campaigner for equality, for suffrage. Um, She's, in, she's uh, featured, uh, at least she's mentioned in the exhibition, which I think is still at the Milwaukee County Historical Society about politics in Milwaukee. There's a display, a section of that includes the, the fight for, for suffrage. And yeah. because, because these two roles were so important in her life, I couldn't figure how I wanted to combine them into one. So, so I made a double Laura Ross Walcott picture here which you're seeing and there's um, there's a little clue to further little, move. Yes. Oh, I was going to say there's a little clue in the back of this image of the of the photo of the uh, the work could oh, you yeah. describe that yeah it says in the back there you can see it says I'm not dead yet <laughs> and well in a way she's not dead yet because what she has done lives on but it had another meaning because there was so much animosity against this woman physician that she was getting people coming to her as patients and, and some of the doctors didn't like that. So someone actually put an obituary in the newspaper announcing her death to get, to get patients away. And so she put in another ad and it said, I'm not dead yet, <laughs> which is a really cool story. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Talk about dirty pool. Um, who, wants, who wants to read their own obituary? Right. Uh, or, as, or as Mark Twain said, the, uh, the reports of his, of his death were wildly exaggerated or something to that effect. And now um, you could spend a whole, um, a whole COVID cloister cloistered time just with her, which I had a lot more to do. <laughs> like but also, would you talk a little bit about um, how you did discover her and also the, another legacy that people might be more familiar with that she was a part of, the sculpture. Well, I, was, I was going to mention how I did that, the second part, but before I did that, I wanted to talk for a moment about one of the, one of the places she practiced medicine was at the Wisconsin Industrial School for Girls, which is um, where pretty much where Columbia St. Mary's is now on that corner. And um, so like one thing leads to another, how I discovered her, I don't know, I was just reading around in some books and I, I found an article on, um, women of Wisconsin. And I thought, man, she's really interesting. Oh my gosh, she's from Milwaukee. Uh, and um, then, I, but then you can go off on another tangent and like study or look into the Wisconsin Industrial School for Girls, which started out as a four-story rambling place in um, 1875, it was horrible. There were children out begging on the streets, wandering around. In the winter, it was a depression. There was sickness. And she volunteered to be their doctor. 
which I found very lovely. And eventually, um, eventually, the person who championed her admission to the medical society was um, at the time a very established physician who had been um, a physician during the Civil War and then returned home to Milwaukee. And he was head of the medical society. And finally, he championed her um, and got her admitted. So um, after his wife passed, they married. He was 30 years older than she was, but um, when uh, they practiced medicine and were very successful and um, he backed her in, in all her activities that had to do with women's rights. And um, I touch on that in my book, what I had decided at one point I was going to make this huge tome and I would have big write-ups on everyone and just be probably have about 30 different people. But I decided to limit it. And so I don't go into great detail. I figure anyone who wants to can take the bit of information explaining the image, a nice, clear and um, Paragon Printers did a wonderful job with it. The color is magnificent. So um, it, people it, can, it really is beautiful. And and be I, I, I wondered if you could just uh, talk uh, just a little bit about that, uh, the, the end of that story, or, or at least a, a part of that story, which has another um, sculptural uh, legacy in Milwaukee about Erasmus. Oh, yeah. Erasmus. Woke up. See, her life is so complex, we could spend all night talking about Laura. <laughs> and after you work and you do these sculptures, it's like you know these people. Um, <clears throat> okay, so many's the time I had passed the Lion Bridge in Lake Park. And then as you're walking along by the Lion Bridge, you see Oh, you look back there, a little bit secluded, is this big bronze sculpture of a man on a horse. And it's just like, oh, okay, man on a horse, some, some dude. <laughs> but once, once I learned about Laura and I figured out Erastus Walcott, wow, okay. He was this Civil War Brigadier General and he was, he was the partner for many years of Laura. And when she passed away in 1915, she left funding behind to commission this statue in honor of her husband. So um, that's how that got there. And there's... Um, you know, she felt this was something she wanted to share with the public, especially Milwaukee. So once you kind of know some of the history, things take on a new meaning. So that is, and I, I found that I was so much more interested in that sculpture too, once I learned about, about Dr. Mm -hmm. Laura Ross Walcott interesting that, that she kept her full name. So someone did have some questions. Uh, one person uh, one person did ask about the connection to the Start World Cup sculpture, questions. which we've answered. The uh, Someone, uh, Daniel O'Keefe said, for us amateur historians, what was it like to work with, his, with his, Wisconsin Historical Society, Milwaukee County Historical Society, UWM Library, and the Milwaukee Central Library? So any, any thoughts about any of those places as, as far as getting sources and archives? I have only the highest regard for all those institutions. Um, they're, they're accessible, they're easy to work with, a little harder for me to get to Madison, but um, the resources there and also the UW library in Madison 
Um, there's, there's just a lot of information available for anyone who has time. And once we're, once we're not sequestered anymore like this, um, it's going to be just a joy to romp through these places again. And, and there are other, uh, someone mentioned that the, um, the, the Milwaukee Jewish Museum has a permanent display about the Salomon cookbook. Mm -hmm. It's a, a fascinating yeah. story. Um, and I, I do recall seeing that. And there's, there's also the, the Chudnow Museum yeah. of yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, has a lot of great uh, stories and objects from Milwaukee. It's a very small museum. It's kind of a house of the, the size of a house. But one of the things what's interesting, I've, um, I've worked with students, uh, adult learners at the Dominican Center and we've taken field trips. And often it's been really exceptional just to take, to just to go into a space like that with people and just see what they respond to. I mean, see what you individually respond to because everyone will respond to something different. But those objects very often can be, uh, trigger people's memories and people's questions and, and thoughts. So this is, I, I think that one of the things I was uh, thinking about is that everyone actually, I think can study history in their own way. Often we've been uh, introduced to history only as facts and figures and things we have to memorize. But I think that whenever there's an access to history, whether it's like these stories, these images, um, that that can trigger our own interest and lead us down our own paths of discovery, as Lolly has described it, that, that she has done. And, and when you speak of objects, a book is an object. Mm -hmm. I hope this object can inspire some people to delve further into Milwaukee history and into their art pursuits. Um, through yes. art, we can bring the dead back to life. Mm -hmm. We can tell our stories and we can share the stories and let's keep that going. Right. And there's, it's sort of, on, I think it's a limitless in terms of what the potential for those stories. Uh, I think that each of us can think about what, what is important that I would like to pass along that what I value, what, what do I value about this place or this person and how, how to share that. And that can be at a, on your own family level or a history of, of a community. So are there, are there any other questions? We're getting, we're getting close to, uh, well, we've got a few more minutes. Uh, we, we thought we would not go past eight o'clock. Um, does anyone have a, a burning question? So there are, uh, the copies are available through Boswell Books and at a 10% at a discount. And let's see. Um, so I, I have, um, let's see. I think I have uh, had my, a lot of my questions answered, but I, I'm curious if there's any other questions in, in the, among the group here. Anyone? Don't be shy. Um, um, Lolly, would you show somebody an actual sculpture? You did that in the practice. So like, somebody asked about the size and I thought maybe you oh, could hold up an actual oh, well, sculpture. Right, that's right, that would be good. So you, could, you can display the whole thing, to turn it around. Now this, this is uh, increased. If we were to have had our democratic convention, a friend had a connection, we were gonna have these on display. Oh, yes. that's great. And there's also another, I'd like to plug the book, uh, Studying Wisconsin by Martha Berglund and Paul Hayes, which right. I believe is available through, through uh, Boswell Books. An excellent, excellent uh, chronicle that uh, tells that story important story so of that, life. That, yeah, we, we agree that we both love Increase Lapham. And, and, and is there, do you have another, another sculpture too? Yeah, I'm gonna get up and find um, one here. One of the things, I, I, I think that the, the 
the idea that Lolly has a, a, a pretty, these are they're obviously they're small enough to, to, for her to hold in her hand or to be seen at, at eye level, but it's, it's a very interesting approach to storytelling as, as an art. And I, I think, I, I love the, the fact that each of them often has some writing on it that tell, further tells the story. So yeah, which one is this? I'll put, very often I fill the back with information. So in case you're looking at the sculpture and you think, what the heck, what's this woman doing holding a toy on her lap and the puppets in the background? We didn't talk about her. There's, like I said, there are 20 sculptures in the book and 20 different stories. But this is Elsa Ulbricht. Elsa um, was a remarkable woman who worked for the WPA and supervised the handicraft project here. There was a display of some of her students' work and her work at Marquette a couple of years ago. And again, on the back, I've incorporated a bit of a story. And on the sides, I've embellished the sides with images of some of the WPA toys, which I'm not sure you can see them, little toys on wheels and things. She worked with puppetry. Personally, she was a weaver. So um, I found at the UWM library, her archives are there because she ended up founding the, being one of the founding members of the art department when it became UWM. And they have pictures of her weaving. And this is the fabric that I tried to duplicate with um, leaves on it from her weaving. Um, she was a painter. So of course we had to include one of her oil paintings. That was her personal work. But she was this marvelous leader and was able to organize all these people who they were like the leftovers from the project because, you know, if you had some skill, you were grabbed for a project. So she took untrained people, taught them how to do doll making, woodworking, weaving, puppetry, made toys for children, made dolls. I think some of that work may be at the Racine Art Museum. Uh, there was a collection that they had of, of, of WPA work I saw. I think that some of her work is, is in that. There was also a, a, an interesting story about Elsa. I was on a tour of, I think it was the Concordia neighborhood, the historic tour, and her home that she had lived in many years had been bought by someone, and they were collecting her work to bring it back into her home. She so... And it was a it was a family effort, and they took a very deep interest in her, in her her work, and just and talk about being in a house that that was carrying the embodiment of Elsa Ubrecht. So there's, um, you know, there's a there's a lot of different ways I think that we can carry history. Um, like I, I personally have some things now that Whitney Gould, that were Whitney Gould's, who was, became a friend of, I became friends with her in the last couple of years of, of her life. Some of you may know, and she was a, a, a writer for many years for the Journal Sentinel. Right. But um, there was a couple of questions that we could answer as, okay. as we wind up. There was somebody, uh, Molly, do you know where the Grappy Bridge is labeled? Could you please repeat the question? Where the grab the bridge, the 16th Street Bridge, where yeah. is it labeled now? Where is the sculpture? No, the label on the bridge. Is there a marker on the bridge or the oh, name? Oh, a of the marker, bridge? yeah. There's a marker on both sides of the bridge. Like right when you're entering it? Right. Uh -huh. Okay. And then someone else was asking about who else was in the sculpture, and that was Val Phillips. Val Phillips, and, yes. And now Val Phillips has been honored much more in the last couple of years. The, the name Fourth Street has been renamed uh, to honor Val Phillips. Right. And there's also uh, there's also a, a mural on the corner of Fourth of, of Val Phillips and uh, North Avenue. Mm -hmm. So. 
there's uh, I think there's a lot of push in Milwaukee now to tell some some of these stories in murals. Uh, that that's one way that some of these stories can be told. So, Daniel, do you have any other questions or anything you'd like to add? Um, I was going to say, let's see. I was going to say that I just um, somebody did ask if the sculptures were available for sale, and I did um, just put in the chat. Um, uh, Lolly's uh, link at the Gallery of Wisconsin Art, where she does have pieces for sale. Um, so you can own a, a Jeshatarsky well, original. <laughs> yes. Um, the Gallery of Wisconsin Art, unfortunately, is closed right now. But I'm sure if you contacted um, Rick Hartman up there, he still has an online Pres uh, presence. So yeah, and it's the link to the online page for you. Right. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think. I think that's. I think. I think. I think that's been an amazing tour of your work and just a, a, a taste of the beautiful um, sculptures that you've done that uh, really bring Milwaukee history to life. Uh, there are more. Uh, we, a lot uh, more. <laughs> a lot more. Uh, we do have the link to purchase here. Um, copies are signed. But uh, Virginia uh, Small, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. And Darlene. Thank you. And, and, and if any of you, some of, a few of the people are not from Milwaukee who are on the Zoom right now, but uh, most of you are, who are from Milwaukee surely are aware of what a, what a treasure Boswell Books is in Milwaukee. Oh. And, and please continue to uh, patronize uh, the, the store in any capacity that you can. And they're doing incredible online programs during COVID. Oh, COVID. thanks, Virginia. Um, we are, uh, we were so grateful to both of you for doing this event. We are also grateful for all of you who have been uh, wonderful supporters of Boswell. I wouldn't have a bookstore without you. Uh, just because you're not here doesn't mean you can't get a copy of Memorable Milwaukee, which is um, unlike some places, uh, some books that we sell, it's not available everywhere. So um, you might want to get it from us. So <laughs> any case, thank you all for a wonderful evening. Um, hope to see another event and uh, hope uh, to see uh, many more sculptures in Milwaukee's future.